I am a computer hacker. <laughs> I've stolen hundreds of millions from banks. I've rewritten the newspapers. And I've controlled satellite systems around our planet. All of this I've done legally and ethically. When you think of hackers, your mind probably goes straight to negative stereotypes. You think about the guys that hijack your social media accounts, steal your personal information, or hold your computers to ransom. We call those black hat hackers. There's another kind of hacker, my kind of hacker. We're the white hat hackers, or ethical hackers. Ethical hackers help companies understand where they might be wrong or where they could be attacked, and protect themselves against the real hackers. Now, you might be wondering why we have black hats and white hats. It's actually quite simple. Look at the old westerns. The good guys have white hats, and the bad guys have black hats. So you might be wondering, what does an ethical hacker actually do? Well, think about it this way. Imagine you want to protect your property. You want to put a lock on it to stop someone from getting in. How do you know that lock's any good, though? You test it. You check that your key works, and that only your key works. You check that it does actually stop people getting in where you don't want them to get in. That's all good, but that's relying on someone coming in through the front door. What about someone that comes in through a window? comes in through the back door, or tunnels underground, or parachutes onto the roof. This is what ethical hackers do. We think about all these possibilities to try and understand where they could occur. I'll give you an example. A client of mine wanted to know, could a hacker get into their systems, add a fake employee, and get them paid by the company without them realizing? So this is what we do. We do all this computer stuff, right? Actually, day one, I go to the building, and I watch people coming in and out. And I see some people have these visitor badges on, all very similar. So I create my own badge, fake details on, put it on, I walk in the building, the security guard gives it a quick look, waves me on through, and I'm inside. I take the badge off, put it in my pocket. Now I'm an employee, because no one inside the building wears their badges, so how do they know the difference between the visitors and the employees if they don't have their badges on? At this point, I'm free to walk around, take in some information, take my time, look like I'm meant to be there. Eventually I come across a theatre, much like this one, and there's a laptop in the corner. Of course, straight away I walk over to it, see a label on it that has a username and password so that people can give their presentations in the theatre. Excellent. So I start to play around with this laptop, see what information's on there that might help me get to what I need to get to. And someone opens the door. That's it, I'm caught already. Except they apologise to me they just wanted to come in and make a quick phone call in peace, and they're sorry that they've interrupted me, because why would a hacker be in there doing something? I'm just one of the employees who's keep doing some work. So rather than having to hang around in the building, I take my own tiny little computer, plug it into the wall, leave it in the little black box in the corner where no one will disturb it. But just for good measure, I put a sticker on it that says, do not remove, and no one puts it in. And I can go back to the safety of my office. From there, I start to look around the network. I've got continued access. I get a few passwords, maybe get into a low-level user account. Luckily, an administrator was doing some work on that machine. I can hijack their account, get more access. Over time, taking this approach of reading, learning, understanding how the business works, get full access to 3,500 of their machines. That took two days. I still need to execute our objectives, though. still need to get our employee added to their system and get them paid. At this point, it's really simple. I have full control. So I bring up HR screen on mine, and from my office I just watch them work, see how they work, see how they add new employees. Once I understand it, I can have my own employee. But I still need someone to authorise their pay. No problem, same process. Watch payroll, authorise the pay, and we're done. From that point, I'm not really a hacker, I'm an employee. In fact, I'm all of their employees. <laughs> so, this took a little bit of thinking differently. Sure, there was some technical skill and some computer wizardry involved, but the majority of it was watching, learning, understanding, and then doing something unexpected. For example, the visitor badge process. Everyone had thought about what would happen when a visitor put their badge on. No one thought about what would happen if a visitor took their badge off. So the original term hack was formed about 50 years ago at MIT, and it didn't mean what we mean it to mean today. The original term hack was some creative project uh, with a specific goal in mind, but the goal wasn't really important. What was important was the process of getting there and 
trying new things to see what would work. Um, the original hackers were also quite known for their creative pranks, such as decorating the domes that look like R2-D2, or controlling the lights on the building to play Tetris on it. In fact, the original MIT hackers really didn't like the use of the word hack to mean the negative stereotypes that we have today. They preferred to call these guys crackers. The important thing about the hackers is the hackers think differently. This need to understand how everything works and to figure it out and then improve upon it is what drives the hackers. The hackers think differently. And I'll give you an example of how. In my building, there's a lift or elevator to take you up and down two floors. Now, it has a problem. At the end of the day, when it's busy or during lunch times, you call the lift, it arrives at your floor, the door's open, and it's full of people you can't get in. You have to wait for the next lift, it takes some time. And so I'm waiting with one of my colleagues, and they just say, perhaps offhandedly, oh, Ben, can't you just hack this lift? And so I thought about it quite seriously for a few seconds. <laughs> and I said, yes, you can, but not in the way you think. So not using computers or Hollywood magic. Actually, we need to understand how it works, and then we can understand how it shouldn't work. You see, the reason that we get such a full lift is because of the way this lift works. You press a button to go to your floor, and the system says, OK, someone needs to go to this floor. What's the nearest lift I can send that has space? And it manages the whole system this way. So the problem is happening because during busy times, one person is pressing the floor and everyone is getting on. The lift thinks that only one person has got on and it thinks the lift is empty. It comes to pick you up and there's no space. So now we understand the problem, we can start to think about how we can take advantage of it. It's the end of the day, I want to get home in a hurry. I don't want to stop for every floor on the way down with other people that perhaps also want to get home in a hurry. So suppose I press the button to go to ground floor a bunch of times system will send an empty lift and it will think it's full and it will go all the way to the bottom without waiting for anyone. So you can then think like a hacker as well. Take a simple process or technology, just one thing every day that you want to hack. Could be something as simple as making toast in the morning. First thing to do, break down the process into all the different parts. So with making toast, it's actually a nice easy one. First we plug in the toaster then power on. Then we take our bread and put it inside, press, set the timer, press the button, we have an agonizing wait, and then finally you get to enjoy your hot fresh toast. So now we've broken down the process, that's what engineers do. Taking it a step further and thinking like a hacker, we now ask, where could it go wrong? And we call those risk outcomes. Now in this scenario, there's really only two risk outcomes at least that we would be seriously worried about. The first, we don't get any toast at all. Or second, we do get toast, but it's not really what we wanted. It might be burnt to a crisp, or it could just be hot, fluffy bread. So, taking those risk outcomes, now look at each stage of the process and say, where could that occur? Well, we could get no toast, we could get to plug the toaster in, that's probably quite an easy one to fix. What if we forgot to put bread in the toaster when we pressed the button? We wouldn't get anything. Or, what if that toast has already been toasted when we press the button again? It would come out completely black. So what's the solution to that problem? Well, we can have a sensor in there to check that the bread has been put in and that it's correct before it goes down and starts cooking. But if we're putting a sensor in to check that, why don't we just have it checked continuously so it can constantly check the colour of the toast and it will always pop up when it's done to the perfect, perfect state. So just like that, by thinking like a hacker, we've not only solved a potential problem, but also come up with a new and better kind of toaster. So in 1984, Stephen Levy wrote a book called Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. And in that book, he described some of the hacker, hacker ethics that they operated by. And these are still really, really relevant today. Things like promoting learning about how the world works, trying to improve things, and judging people on their ability rather than any other unimportant values like race or age. Now, these values are still really important today. And in fact, that might be why you still hear the job being called to as hacker. Although mistrusting authority might not be quite what we're looking for today, certainly mistrusting the way things have always been done, questioning why something is a certain way is a really important skill to have. And that's why we need more people to think like hackers. When I interview potential candidates for a job, I don't necessarily look at skills or experience, I look at their mindset and their passion. You can get skills and experience, but having that mindset is a gift. And 
questioning the way things work means you will always have that desire to learn and to find new information. Now, perhaps the best example I can find of the hacker ethics in more modern times, not as far back as 1984, is actually in a commercial that was produced by a car manufacturer. I'm going to share that with you. Okay, why go to the moon? Clearly not everybody believes okay is okay. We don't. And we were wondering, what would the world be like if its favorite word wasn't okay? What if we could change it? What if the word was, what if? Now you know how to think like a hacker. Go out there and every day ask, 